Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we got some catching up to do, Rhett. We haven't talked about our breaks. And here we are, slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, right in the middle of 2023, January. Well, you know, We're not in the middle of the year. We're in the middle of the start of the year. So like- Is that interesting to you? Well, what I was going to say was we typically are able to really successfully hide from one another the things that we're going to talk about on Ear Biscuits, but there's some circumstantial factors that have played into the fact that I feel like I've already told you a few of the things that I'm going to tell you again because we hung out with friends. If there's not, if there's not, Mike's rolling. Okay. I, I don't listen to you. I, I saw that you had a faraway look in your eyes. I just thought it was your new glasses. I'm still, There's I'm a still, far still adjusting to them. Faraway look in your eyes. How are you processing the feedback on Merle, your new glasses? Merle because Haggard. it's one of those things where I don't give a shit. Uh, it's one of those things where I you, did talk you, to Christy. You, about made, it. you made this choice, like you know, in our world, you made this choice like a month or more ago, six, uh, two months ago, right? To, to, I bought the glasses and I started wearing them, in, especially in my own time. And uh, non-screen time. But I try to avoid, you know, I don't like to completely disengage from comments and, and gen, you know, because I just feel like that's too, too disengaged from what people are saying. But I try to just dip in a little bit. And then it's just, of yeah. course, because yeah, I when we're, recording, we're recording this after there's only a few episodes of GMM out for the year. And... People have opinions about your glasses. Oh, of course they do. I I love that they have opinions, and I do give a little bit of a shit. Let's be real. I give. I've given. It's like, you know, the when you like when it's rabbit turds. You know, you can almost eat those. What? Well, because they look like looked, cereal. Okay, I'm saying right. if if I had to, you, eat, know, you know what? I'll save them next time. If I had to eat a turd, the rabbit would be probably the first. Yeah, but I'm talking about my turds that just happen. To I don't want to eat your rabbit. turds. I have drank your piss before. When, when I'm talking about rabbit turds, I'm talking about a, through a filter. My turds, your turds. Okay, keep going with this analogy that I don't understand yet. <laughs> I, it's it's a little shit. Oh, you give a little shit. I give a little rabbit turd about what people think about my glasses. Um, but I'm determined to stick. To my guns, which is oh. I liked these glasses. I like them too. I think you should. St- I, I, first of all, I, when I have the gray beard, I can wear these glasses, the gray ones or the clear ones. But like when I don't have the beard, I really like the brown ones. So I actually have the beard just so I can wear these glasses. What happens if you wear the gl- glasses with the beard? I don't think it. The other one. What oh, happens if you wear one? the dark glasses with those? Th- that, that that's beard? fine. That's fine, but I can't. You can't wear those without a beard? That's what I feel like. Why? I don't know. It's just something about the look of it hmm. that I, you know, I, that I, that's how I think about it. But yeah, I, I know that people are talking about the glasses and that's great. It gives some people something to talk about because yeah. they Let's want something give to talk them about. something to Bonnie Raitt. Um, I'm two for two, man. Give me some more song song lyrics. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're we're gonna get into the stuff that maybe you've already told me a little bit about. I'll 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 get into a little. I'll tell bit it better. I'll tell I it better this time. I gotta be honest. I think I'm dealing with just a little bit of a hangover this morning. I'm in a bit of a. I I have a tinge of hangover. In my experience, it doesn't take a whole lot of alcohol to put you in a hangover state. Well, I can't tell if it's from alcohol or if it's just from hockey. Um, well, those are difficult to. I think I have a sometimes. hockey hangover. Last night, uh, I went with my my neighborhood friends. This has become quite a thing. I see. Yeah, there's a group of guys, dads, who um, they discovered that somebody had never been to a hockey game. But th- so they this were like, is "We're not, going to a hockey." This game. is not uh, fo- Lando football flag. It is flag football friends, dads. Yes, same thing, mm-hmm. same group. Mm-hmm. Okay, and. Um, so we went to a what I 
call, told Christy this morning was the Sacramento Kings. <laughs> and I was like, hold on, that's not right. It's the LA Kings. She was like, I know who they are. They wear black. And I'm like, dang, you're right, girl. Well, I found it interesting when you were leaving last night and you said you were going to a hockey game. And I said, a Kings game, which I've never been to. And you were like, yeah. And I was like, how has that slipped under the radar for 12 years that we've been in Los Angeles? Right. That they play at the Staples Center, which is now called the Crypto Center. So when I said that the Sacramento Kings played at the Staples Center, it's kind of like true in a past world kind of a thing. Anyway, hmm. listen to this, man. At the end of the game, match thing, they told me, sorry, hockey lovers. You know what? I'm just a newbie. Be patient with me. Um a, a dedicated Kings fan in full get up, um, there with his son, kept leaning over and like emoting to his 15 year old son about things that were happening. When the whole thing was over, he turned around to us. We were like on the fifth row. It was like really good, really nice seats behind the plexiglass. And um, he said, you know what, There's, this was a really great game. You guys saw, he could tell that like we were, had never been there before. Or just, we, that Based on what we were saying through the thing, uh, me and a couple of other people, I think he picked up on the fact that like we were coming to grips with professional hockey for pretty much the first time. All you and all the dads? No, just me and like one other dad that was next to me. And then okay. there were a couple, I mean, one guy's Canadian, so. <laughs> yeah, and then an, blood. And then another guy is a physical therapist. He craps so hockey pucks. He ne- yeah, he does. He does. All Canadians do. Right. That's why they're totally Even their different. rabbits shit hockey pucks. Right. Uh huh. You can see they, they build a lot of things out of them too because the way they stack them. So this guy turned around and he was like, this is a really good game. A lot of things happened in this game that you, that you rarely see. A fight? A lot of them happened. Well, I mean, t- there was, um, towards the end of the game, there was that situation where they're down by two and they don't have enough time to come back. And I'm talking about the power play. Um, uh, they took the they took the keeper out, yeah, and they replaced him with another player. So the goal was just left bare ass open. Just, I mean, it's just like like been over a barrel back there, yeah, right? Uh, with your britches down. But it's so little that it doesn't really matter, or does it? Because so all the action was down here at our end where they were trying to catch up. The Kings Kings won, so it was the other team that was trying to catch up. What was the other team? The the white one. You don't know who it was? Uh, it was Edmonton. That's a Canadian team. Yeah. Yeah, which, uh, anyway, some, some, so one goodness. of the, one of the kings really paying attention. Really got the puck. And I'm telling you, he was still on the defensive side of the rink and he sat there and just like launched it. Shoo! Right on the goal. Goal! That never happens, I'm told. This was after the first fight had occurred. Oh. And let me tell you, there was a fight, man, right there, pushing people against the plexiglass. There was a dude, like, hitting the plexiglass. Like, people, I I was like, is that okay? And they were like, well, he's being a little obnoxious, but it is okay. Is that okay? And then the... All of a sudden, a second fight broke out, like, you know, 10 minutes later. How long did they let it go on? Um, first one, not too long. Second one, a little bit longer. And it was like right there in front of us. That was amazing. But how committed, my experience with hockey fights is that it's like. It was like they were smiling a little bit. It's sort of bit. like, yeah, we're doing this. It's kind of a routine almost. Like, I'm not actually trying to really hurt you. Well, the thing that um, my Canadian friend explained to me was, he was like, yeah, that's, um, they, oh, he, I was, he speaks English. I was, he speaks English. Interesting. I was like, they measure the hits. Like you look up there at the scoreboard and there's the score, which I totally expected. Then underneath it, there was like hits. They count the hits and display them. This is when it, a hit is when you have the puck and then somebody hits you, like checks you. Like they measure that. For what? Well, he said somebody but, to bet on. He said it's a probably. He he said it was a measurement of like taking a toll on the other team. It's like, just something they like to measure. Like street fighter hitting each other. So then, uh, Will the 
physical therapist, he was explaining to me, he was like, um, there's going to be another fight. I was like, what? It's like sneezes. There's going to yeah. be another fight? I didn't think they fought anymore. There's always another one. And then that's when the second fight happened. And then when that fight was over, he was like, yeah, this, I, how did, I was like, how did you know that was going to happen? He was like, well, the, I could tell that they were getting real chippy with each other. And I was like, I can infer what that means. And then it, it creates a, like a, an energetic shift in the game. So, it, so fighting is actually used as a technique to shift the emotional energy like to, in, in your favor. Which I, like I never dunk. thought about it. It's yeah, like it's a dunk. Yeah, it's like it's like decimating the other team. Like if you can, it, and on the other side of that second fight, yeah, I mean the energy was totally different. Another thing, talking about energy that I didn't know about hockey was, he said, you know, if you look, they are subbing themselves out every forty-five seconds or so. Like in the middle of play, you'll just see. A group of people jump over, and then a group of people retreat to the to the bench. And he said, because they're going at such an intensity that they can only last for like forty five seconds. You can relate to that, right? Is this a sexual joke? Yeah, that was a sexual joke. Okay, it almost landed. I don't even think you were listening. It landed. <laughs> <laughs> you glazed over, man. Uh, See, yeah. what, I, I lost interest. That's this why is the point land. where I need to punch you to really change the energy. Yeah, I mean, you're <laughs> talking about, yeah, okay. So, but yeah, they have to, they, they're going at such an intensity that they got to, that they got to rest constantly because the game is so fast. Like, I, much respect to the hockeyers. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's better than the soccer. It's like soccer, but a little, a little too cold. I'm going to dress warmer next time. But it's fast, and it's intense. Could you keep up with the puck? And then, mm, kind of. And then, I'm like, what is that on the, uh, on the ice? There's like something here, there's something there, there's four of these things. And then I, I look up, and, two, and lo and behold, my friend was right. They, some two players had thrown their gloves to the ground, yeah, and then they were they were they had their dukes up, and they were about four feet fr apart from each other, just squared off like two boxers in a ring, yeah. And everybody just started backing away. The, the ref could have easily just right there in the middle of that and said, "Nope." Everybody just backed away, and made a circle. Yeah, that's what they did, and they were duking. And then they just started like punching each other in the raw face, but but not like not as aggressively as this, U, like yeah, UFC. This, UFC. There was blood, dude. No, no, it's not UFC. But there was blood coming out of the oh, guy's face. Oh, they'll knock their teeth out. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's crazy. Three fights. You I'm know, never going back. It's never going to be that good again. Uh, I'll give you a hundred dollars if you could tell me what icing is. Uh. Well, I'll let's see. I don't want to spoil it, but I'll I'll tell you on your birthday. Uh, well, that was your opportunity to say what goes on a cake, and then you would have gotten an easy. Well, that's kind of what I did, Rhett. Um, Get it? Your birthday? Oh, that was pretty good. See, it was. I'm a thinking okay, man's I'll comedian. I'll give you hundred dollars. Come on, man. You you got to. Hey, I'm. You, are you hungover? Come uh, on, man. Come I on. I think man. it must be contagious. Slap yourself. You know the interesting thing is that. Um, I kind of got a, I got a little bit of a uh, inside look at this over Christmas. Hockey? I, this I wasn't even going to tell this story, but I, now that you're telling it. You can't resist. My father-in-law yes. is the official dentist of the Carolina Hurricanes. <laughs> and they, they say the fewer teeth that they have, the better player they are. Yeah. And... Uh, we played poker one night uh, with him. Don't tell me you use hockey teeth and a and a and a couple of his uh, dentists and some other guys. Okay. And one of the dentists was sitting next to me and was basically saying, "Yeah, I gotta, I gotta go in in the morning." It like it was like I go in on Christmas Eve or something. It was going in at a time that he wasn't planning on going in. Because he had to do some, somebody got their teeth knocked out. 
Hockey um, per person. And of course, he couldn't say who it was. Like he couldn't tell us in mixed company because this is all this is doctor patient privilege HIPAA stuff. So he can't like discuss it openly with people like me there. Oh. But he was basically, I got to go in. You know, there was an accident or whatever. But if I could tell you who he was, you would know him. Of course, you probably could have watched the game and and or the match and figured it out. But yeah, I mean, it happens on such a regular basis that of course. Not only is this like a sponsorship kind of relationship, but uh, and and by, and by the way, anytime you want to go to if now that if you're a hockey guy, anytime you want to go to a Carolina Hurricanes game back home, they've got a box because they're the official dentist of. I want to be the right Carolina Hurricanes. I, if I can't slap the plexiglass, oh, that's a problem. I don't want to go. I, I, but you get free food. I don't want to go further away. You know me. I'm not big into food. I'm more into just hockey. Like it's all about the game to me. At one point. I started talking to um, my friends about, um, well, you know, how often, how often they have sex. And my- my, During the game? Yeah, my Canadian friend said, this is the type of thing we should talk about over coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad they've got, I'm glad they're holding you in line a little bit and not letting you dictate that conversation. Yeah, I'm the low man on the totem pole over there. It's nice. Because, you know, here I just, I just ride and high. I get away with everything. <laughs> um, Hockey man. So they didn't. They didn't. They didn't volunteer their, that information. But if they did, you would now tell it to all of us on a podcast. Uh, if they I, told I got, you how often they had I, sex. I got. I got some good data. Uh, I had a lot of sex over my break. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but first, I guess in some sort of vertical. Uh, Bite size form is on is on Snapchat. Sounds pretty awesome. Sounds pretty awesome to me. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't go on Snapchat. We are where you are. If you're on Snapchat, then conveniently you can, you can, we can be there with you. Ear Biscuits is supported by Chime. Do you look at your credit score every day? N- not every day. But you know who does? Chime does. Mm -hmm. With their secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can start to build credit with your own money. Chime reports your payments to credit bureaus to help you build credit over time. Their members see an increase of 30 points on average. All of this with no annual fees, no large security deposits, or credit checks needed to apply. This would have been uh, helpful to us right after we uh, graduated college. And because mm-hmm. with the, the state we had left our apartment in by writing our names in the bottom of the bathtub with that grip st- tape, grip tape, it, my credit score, my credit score tanked at that point. I don't know what happened to yours, man. It wasn't good. It, it took years to build back up. We could have used Chime at that time, but it wasn't available. So start your credit journey with Chime. Sign up takes only two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at chime.com slash ear. That's chime.com slash ear. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stride Bank N.A. pursuant to a license from Visa USA. Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. Regular on-time payment history can have a positive impact on your credit score. Impact of score may vary and some users' scores may not improve. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply except at MoneyPass ATMs in a 7-Eleven or any AllPoint or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. So your 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 break. I feel like I want to hear about your break. Okay, I can I can uh, I can scratch that itch for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My break started. Uh, it, well, summarize it was a trip to Raleigh, to North Carolina, and then it was home of the hurricane. Followed by a trip to Mexico with just my wife. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Let's start though. Let me set the scene for you. December 20th at Los Angeles International Airport. (laughs) Okay. We've never flown on that particular day. We'd usually fly 17th. Maybe 18th. Jessie's birthday is the 18th, so we typically try not to travel on her birthday, and we are usually in North Carolina for her birthday. Kind of times out most of the time, so we get in there and have like a week before Christmas. But we were like, let's have her birthday here. Didn't we do something for her birthday? Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we ran. That's a, the last time I saw you. We ran a party bus. 
Oh, gosh, we did. We rented a party bus. Oh, that's a story in and of itself. It was full of glitter. Oh, my gosh. It turns out... Oh, good. yeah, oh, man. We got to tell this story, right? Well, <laughs> I didn't think about this. First we, of all, it wasn't okay. my idea to do the, the party bus. And also, it was... It was Jenny, Mike's wife. It was her idea to do a limo because we were talking about what we we're going to do for Jesse's birthday. She's like, well, let's get a limo. And Jesse's like, that's a great idea. Turns out in 2022, when you request a limo, it's not going to be like the limo that took us to prom, which is like a long Lincoln. It's going to be most likely a party, party bus because it's just got more room and you can stand up inside. It's no better. stripper pole in this one, unfortunately. But um, it was... So yeah, anyway, you can stand up. Well, you can't, but I could barely stand up in there. It's kind of a last minute thing, but um, great idea. Your, um, your, well, your wife had a little trouble. Yeah, she. I, you know, she gets car sick. I've told, I've told the stories over the years of like just the art of pulling over and getting her out quick enough so that. I can start filming with my phone before she actually starts retching into the ditch. Like, I've gotten really good at that. Like, yeah. pull over, park, whip out the phone, beat her to where the do punch. You, will you post that on Snapchat? I post that on Snapchat, yeah. That's the only thing you post on Snapchat. But your biscuits is on Snapchat. Do you hear that? Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. If you want to watch your biscuits there, you can. Um, she gets car sick, so like... She she got car sick pretty quick, right? Well, before we left your neighborhood. Before we left the before and we I was like within gotta, one mile. We got a ways to go. And then we got her to like roll the driver to roll the window down so we could see him. And we talked Christy into asking him, Can can is it okay if I sit in the front seat with you? I'm getting car sick. He was like, I would love for you to do that, but I don't have another seat. And we quickly put together. Yeah. Well, first of all, they, he didn't. He didn't. There's the obvious reason for this because the you don't want a sick woman. The drunk riding. Well, it doesn't have to be a woman. I mean, a, a well, person. She, was, she is a woman. But <laughs> you don't want the person who is most likely to vomit to be up there with the with the driver. No matter what gender. Correct. Right. Right. In this case, it was your wife, though. Right. And also, Mike was. Uh, a little car sick. He, he was getting car sick. But he well. just got quiet, whereas Christy kind of like, she was in the front and we were all sitting in the middle in the back. You and I were, by this point, you and I were in the back and we were having our own little conversation. You were showing me something on your phone. and Which is a great way to get car sick. Which is probably something on TikTok. And Christy was up at the front, turned sideways, kind of in a vertical fetal position, like... And I kind of leaned over to you. I was like, if she vomits, I hope she does it down into like the floorboard. So when we open the, the sliding door, it'll just kind of like cascade out. This is what I was saying. And you're showing me something on the phone. <laughs> and, you know, and it's all like, poor pitiful Christy. You know, it's like, you got to laugh to keep from crying. It's kind of how I felt about it. And then she was having a tough time. But then all of a sudden, kind of like, you know how in Lord of the Rings when like, Gollum is talking to himself and it's like Smeagol versus Gollum and like who's gonna win? And then he he you know he turns his his um face away from the camera and then all of a sudden he turns back and he's like ah, and it's like oh Gollum wins. Like there was a Christy version of that where like all of a sudden she whips around and looks straight at me and you and she's like don't you think about putting this video on Ear Biscuits. <laughs> she thought you were filming yeah. her. And she was already And we jumping. would never do that. She was jumping to the conclusion that not only was I filming, but that we were planning on posting it. We would never do that. We would, I mean, we wouldn't even talk about it on Ear Biscuits. Right, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't even do that. Right, yeah, we wouldn't recount the story in detail. No. Uh, but she did make it, but there, it. She there, did make it. There she was, did not vomit. But she. She retched at one point. She did a dry heave. Oh, yeah? Did you not notice that? <sighs> the thing I didn't understand is why we didn't give her something to do it in. Because you're talking about doing it on the floor. I don't want just loose vomit inside of a, my party bus. You know what I mean? Like It's put, hosable. Put it, yeah, but we don't have a hose right now at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't have a bucket. Yeah, but 
At least I was thinking about it a little bit. We could have given her like three champagne glasses. <laughs> you know, it's like we had those. <laughs> like, Fill these up. Like 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 just... It's like a bartender. <laughs> we should have given her a receptacle is all I'm saying. Yeah, poor girl. Uh, so it was, it was pretty- she shaped up, It though. was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> trying, to, trying to just like tr- how much not partying was happening on this party bus. But it, you got to go back to your story, dude. I mean, we haven't even gotten to your vacation. Oh, um, we were talking about the airport. I don't know what day you flew, but I'm, I just have never been to LAX when it was so crazy. Now, I show up as a policy. I'm a typical dad, or, you know, I get there early. My rule is we get there two hours early, right? Which is what they kind of tell you to do, but a lot of people are like, oh, an hour and a half. But mm-hmm. I try to get there two hours early. Well, we show up and it is just a madhouse. Bedlam. And we have to go to, because Shepard is 14 and the way that we ended up like putting the, the, we weren't all on the same reservation, but typically you can't just get a boarding pass for a 14 year old. You have to get into the, I need assistance. Like I need to talk to an agent line, which is what we always do. Yep. I don't do the, I don't know. I so we get in that line and I'm like, this line is moving very, very slowly and it's very, very long and I'm not that good at math anymore, but it doesn't seem like we're going to make it. And then I ask one of the representatives of the airline that we were flying, I was like, you think we're gonna make it? We, we, we got a flight to RDU and she says, uh, I don't know, I've gotta see how things are shaking out, but we recommend that you get here uh, four hours early. Cool for domestic flights and five hours early for international flights during this this time of year at LAX. And I'm like, and I'm like, late I'm like well, my that. flight's leaving in like an hour and 35 <laughs> minutes. Oh God. And I began to panic a little bit. And I, this is one, I have some certain, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some things I learned about my own anxiety over the course of the vacation, but it's well established that I have anxiety, not about the process of flying, but the process of of check, getting, not being late, not, not missing the flight. Yeah, okay. And having to introduce like complications where you have to then get on the phone with somebody. I, I, get, I actually get anxious thinking about it because I hate having to like figure logistical things out, even though, it's just going to be me like texting Kara and having her do it. Even that is just, you know, it's very stressful for me. And so, um, <laughs> and also have, uh, you know, very slight PTSD from getting stuck in Atlanta, Georgia for three days one day because of a flight, missing a flight. Not Nothing against Atlanta. Just wasn't expecting to have to get all my clothes from Target um, for three days. But the... Um, so at that point, I panicked a little bit, and mm-hmm. I said, well, I'm going to go out to the uh, Skycap, you yeah. know, check Cur- in on the curb. curb. I, I left the family in line. I go out there, and it, you know, it's a shorter line. It seems to be moving pretty fast. So we get in line there, and then we get up to the guy. He's like, everybody here over 18? First, I mean, my heart just immediately like goes to my throat. I'm like, no. He said, oh, you can't check. Yeah, you can't check in here. Because uh, mm-hmm. we were actually on three different confirmation numbers. So you had to get back in the other line? No, I said, he. I think, I'm just going to, I don't know the guy's name. Maybe he was an angel. You know how we have experiences with angels, me and you. All the time. And I said, um, oh, Michael, man, listen, Michael. we all have the last same last name. And... Uh, we're on different confirmation numbers, but we're all in the same family. And he was kind of like, okay, let me see what I can do. I don't know how this stuff works. I don't know, like, this is a policy, but I'm about to violate the policy. And then, so he goes through the process and he's like, give me a second. I, I'm, I'm going to go see if I can figure this out. And I like pulled out a, a pulled, you know, you tip these guys as part of the deal, but I pulled out a $50 bill. I just happened to have a 50. No, you didn't. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> and like, as he's leaving to go like handle it, like give it. And it's court, I mean, hey, listen, it works. What? He came back and he had Shepard's boarding pass. We're good to go. We, we made the flight. I just, it felt incredible. Uh, $50 he lighter. May have, he may have done it without the tip. I mean, I was going to tip him anyway, but I wouldn't, wasn't necessarily going to give him 50 bucks. Um, Gee. I don't know what standard tipping for the Skycap guy is. 
I usually throw them a couple of twenties, which I guess is forty dollars. So maybe I was maybe it was a standard that is tip. that is forty dollars. Um, <laughs> yeah, two <laughs> times twenty is forty. <laughs> I've forgotten that. So anyway, my vacation started with this like elevated heart rate. You know, okay, a little bit of a almost crisis. Now none of my family's freaking out. They don't care. You That's know? why you're freaking out because you 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 have you you have to do it. Well, it's up to you. I feel responsible for you them. Are. You know, you are. Um, because you you're know, giving them, that's a gift you give them. But when because when me and you travel, I don't feel that way. Like I don't I don't have a lot of anxiety about like I'm just like if we miss this flight. I mean I'm not as lackadaisical as you, as you the way that you approach flights. But I'm also like, hey, if we miss this flight, like we'll get on another one. We'll tell a story about it. But the family, it's just like you think, especially around Christmas, because yeah, I like, get it. I you know, get it. I get it. You're worked up. Um, it's understandable. Now, not a whole lot happened in North Carolina. It was a quick trip. Skip that, man. Uh, I, I will do one highlight, though. Oh, let's hear that. So we're still, um, the, the cabin uh, that I've spoken of before is not currently habitable because my wife is having her way with it. Uh, but this will become the place that we stay when we go to North Carolina. Uh, one, one year. Uh, down the road. Yeah, this coming Christmas. But uh, I noticed that some have been eating my freaking log cabin. When you, you, I saw that you posted a, a picture of wood, but yeah. I, didn't, I didn't realize, I didn't put it together that that, that was actually the that house. That it was a real, that it was a real, that, that, it, that was the house. That, that I was being sincere. No, I just thought it was like a wood pile. It was just the corner of a log cabin where the wood oh. comes together. And, you know, like before we got this thing, it was all like sealed and stuff. And so I, it was inspected. Like I knew that there was not this like raw wood. And, okay. you know, as, I'm not there on a regular basis. And so like you checking in and we did we did some work and, and met some guys out there to do some work. But I'm looking at this. And I'm like, I didn't want to do this because I don't really like to do the whole like, here's a problem for Twitter to solve because you know you're going to get like 95% just Yeah, why'd jokes. you do it that way? Well, what was the other way to do it? Reddit? Yeah, well, Google. Can you Google an image? I tried that. Yeah, you can do that. I tried that. Huh. So. Crowdsourcing. Uh, I saw that Alex... Punch gave you a smart ass response. I knew I was going to get a lot of smart ass responses, and I actually was sort of like, I'm going to look, okay, I'll be entertained by the smart ass responses. Okay, teach you not to take it too seriously. But I hopefully will find the correct response because I was like, this can't be like a beetle or something. Like, it looks like something was gnawing on it, but like, what? Then I was like, is a, you're like a beaver that, I don't think beavers would do this. Like a beaver coming from that creek, you know, behind the house and like coming up there. Like, no, beavers. They like cut down trees to put and make a dam out of. I don't know. They're trying to cut down my house and make a dam out of my house? It'd be a cool thing to document. But one guy responded and said, I am a pest control specialist in North Carolina and I am 100% certain that, wow. it, that it is squirrels. Squirrels. Because this time of year, squirrels are collecting wood for their nests. So they're taking their little front teeth and they're just kind of shaving off like the out le, the, the layer. And apparently- you Your can house put, is being eaten by squirrels. And apparently you can put something on the house. Like once you like sand it down, finish it, you can put something on the house in those places to keep the squirrels. Okay. But it's also because we haven't been there and squirrels are like, oh, nobody's home, let's eat it. You know, let's eat the home now that no one's there. Ah. So we gotta, I mean- it's like a cartoon. You come back next time and like half your home is gone, like in kind of like a, in a squirrel organic shape. It's I don't like, think they're going to eat much. You know what you need to do, man. You know what you need? You need some really responsible, handy squatters. You just need some people to squat, keep an eye on the place. How about just put a, the a mannequin on the front porch? Or a mannequin on the front porch. I think it's a mannequin with a like mechanism. A, what a mechanized a mannequin. mannequin that looks like he has like a twenty-two. Just a mannequin with a BB gun. There could be a like, he could raise he could raise the BB gun and then the little speaker 
could could do like a countdown from a dramatic countdown from ten. Like ten, home, like Home Alone. Nine. You yeah. want me to Macaulay Culkin my yeah, front porch? Yeah, I do. Tis this was the season. I like this idea. Well, I don't want to talk about Mexico. I'm mean, gonna hear a little bit. I mean, I'm hear a little bit about your trip before I continue on with my trip. I experienced the airport. If we have to go there again, uh, I don't want to do it. On let's see, we picked up my mom on December twentieth. I think wasn't it like the day the day we were leaving. You were picking her up. Yeah, I think maybe I it was that. the 19th. But like we go to pick her up. And she like, I said, she calls me when she lands. And then I'm like, text her. I'm like, get your, once you get your bags and come out to the curb, then we'll come up and get you. Cause you don't want to have to park. You know, I, I, I wanted to avoid parking. And then about that time I hit this traffic and like, we could not get into the airport. And then I couldn't get in touch with my mom. Like she was not answering the phone. It had been uh, 30, 40, 50 minutes since we talked, I was like, she's definitely, I, what's happened? She's got a North Carolina only she, cell phone. She's plan. not, she's not in communication and I can't get to her. I don't know where she is. Mm. And then we're like driving around and it is bedlam. People trying to get picked up. And I'm like, Christy, we just need to start looking. Maybe my mom is out here. My mom, this is the first time she's ever traveled alone. And here she is at LAX, who knows where? Like out of like out of reach, and I was like, she's supposed to be at terminal. I guess three it was. I can't remember. So then at terminal two, Christy looks up and she's like, "There she is." And this had been like I'd been worrying for like forty five minutes, and then she like instantly saw her and like get her in the car, and my mom's like sweating profusely and like talking about how I've been trying to reach you. I. I used this stranger's phone and I got them to call you too. And then all of a sudden, and she was like, it was, it was all I could do just not to burst into tears. And my poor mom is trying not to cry the whole time. And I'm realizing that my phone is the problem. Yeah, you had like notifications. You had like. It, I don't, it's one of those inexplicable things where you just need to restart your phone. So it like, it says it is connected, but it no longer was. Something about How many people the hex were? of LAX. I felt so bad. It was my fault. Well, but we got we not, got home. not to be critical of your plan, um, but uh, I would have suggested you with your mother traveling alone for the first time that maybe the the uh, parking and meeting her inside was probably worth the headache. Yeah, we were. I was willing. She hasn't to do navigated that. an airport. I was willing to do that. Herself. You know what? Well, you know what? We threw her in the deep end. And she swam out. It was good. It worked out. Everybody's everybody. So she wasn't mad at you. No. Oh, that's good. Uh, there's, she's, I mean, there's, she's a sweet lady. Uh, but there's, yeah, she's sweet lady. PTSD, but, but okay. Um, so mom stayed at our house. We had a great time, and then we flew back with her and saw everybody. But then, like, turns out Chrissy's side of the family was sick, so like we couldn't. We ended up not seeing them, and it was only a few days home. So we saw my side of the family. We had a we we had a good time. Um, it was short and sweet. We get we get back home, um, and then we just take it easy. You know, I didn't go to Mexico or nothing. Yeah. Uh, I just took it easy. I got in my uh, my pressurized tank, my healing tank, trying to like make sure that this bone is. Oh, totally you got healed. in the hyperbaric. I got in the hyperbaric a lot. Taking naps. It was like it's like my little it kennel. Well. Um, I'm actually going to the doctor in a few hours to get an x-ray to make sure that there's union. Well, it looks like there's union. I'm no doctor. It still feels a little weird, but um, maybe it's just that I need, to, I need to get in with that PT. I'm feeling good, though. I'm feeling good about it. So uh, not too much to report for, for my, uh, my holiday beyond that, I think. Um, I was just thinking about you in Mexico, just just hoping you were having a grand old time. I had a great time. So the the impetus for this, we knew we wanted to do some kind of trip, and you know, as originally planned, it was with our children. Oh, um, but I was like, y'all got y'all want to go to Mexico for a week? We were supposed to do this last year, by the way. 
COVID canceled that. So yeah. I had to, I, I was kind of playing this mental game of not fully committing to you know, like gotcha. simultaneously being very much like way more looking forward to being on vacation than I should have the way that you usually look forward to a vacation and you think it's going to solve all your problems and be this incredible reset. But then the other part of my brain was like, it's probably not going to happen because somebody's going to get COVID, whatever. Uh huh. But when we asked the boys if they wanted to go, it started with Locke and he was like, ah, you know, I'm coming back from school and I really want to see my friends in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. We were like, okay. And then Shepard was basically, I don't want to go by myself and nobody really, no, no friends to take because they're doing their own thing. So I was like, okay, we'll go by ourselves. We'll, 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 we'll sacrifice for That's you guys okay. and okay. just go on a vacation, just the two of us, which means that Locke and Shepard would be home alone for a week in Los Angeles by themselves, 18 year old, 14 year old, who've never been responsible for a home and our two dogs. Yeah. So there were a number of heated uh, interactions leading up to that, which where, where I, there was some things that happened in the days leading up to just going to North Carolina when, when Lot was already home that kind of demonstrated and reminded me that they're just teenagers and they don't clean up after themselves and they leave stuff hanging around, all this stuff. And I was like, you can't leave food out that could kill these dogs. You know, like we have, have like very dad conversation with them. And like, you gotta make <laughs> sure, you can't leave the door open and then go outside. Like basically yeah. I was just kind of worried about the dogs. Yeah. Let's just to be frank. Yeah. And, um, but we eventually got to a place where I said, if the house is clean and the dogs are alive and we return, then I will be fine. Okay. And then uh, some friends ended up coming through town and needing a place to stay. And I was like, yes, please stay at our home. <laughs> Adults. Right. So they only ended up having like two days alone. So that ended up being fine. And I was actually thinking it was going to affect my enjoyment in Mexico because I didn't want to be thinking about what was going on in my house and like having to check in constantly. But this is the longest trip that, Je we don't, I mean, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think this is the longest trip that just the two of us have had since our honeymoon, because we just don't go on vacation, just the two of us. I mean, we're going like a, a weekend trip, a weekend getaway, but not a few like days. seven days. But away. yeah, seven days. And a few highlights. I mean, we were in uh, Playa del Carmen, which is actually where we went on our honeymoon. And, oh. but we were kind of like at a resort that we left just a couple of times. It was definitely like focusing on the chill aspect of a vacation and trying to just completely unplug and enjoy ourselves. Nice. And which came at a really good time for both of us. Jesse's had the busiest year of her professional life. And so she's been like, you know, running like crazy. We had a crazy year as always, so it's the break is always welcome. Um, I swam in a cenote. Cenote. Three cenotes. I've seen pictures of these. It's like, uh, like an, an aerial photo of a cenote is just like jungle, but then all of a sudden there's like a donut hole in a jungle and it's water. It's like a, but it's like a, so it's like a pond, but not like the, it's there's like it's deeper. It's, it's a lot. It's essentially deeper. a cave that that has an opening somewhere to the surface, and it's you know it's it's in areas that have a lot of limestone, and I don't know exactly what the process is, but any place that there's a lot of limestone, at one point that was ocean, and then it's like over time it kind of drains out and reveals this like Swiss cheese essentially, like the the earth becomes Swiss cheese that is filled with water. Okay. And at some point, apparently, that the, these caves didn't have water in them, and like people could kind of walk around. And then, in relatively recent geological past, they have filled up with water, and they filled up with like pristine, crystal clear water. Is it? It's, it's rainwater, or like groundwater, or ocean water, salty. It flows to the ocean. They flow to the ocean, and they so are fresh water. They're fresh water. Oh. And the actual and and like so, we went with uh, a guide. Uh, whose name was Limbert. Limbert. Uh, who was actually, um, with that name, you may not, uh, he was local. <laughs> he was <laughs> okay. local. And he's kind of a archaeologist slash historian. Like he gets his, 
uh, he gets his like license as a as like a, a historical guide to this region of Mexico. He like gets it updated every few years. So he's like, this dude knew a whole lot, and he's also, I didn't know this, and this is just ignorance on my part. But like, if you had have told me like, okay, uh, are there Mayans? still around, I would be like, well, yeah, I'm sure there's like descendants of Mayans and uh, the Mexican people or whatever, but like Mayans and, and, and Mexican people are, it's two distinct groups. Okay. And the, and the Mayans, there's still like millions of people who are like of Mayan heritage and speak Mayan. Like he grew up speaking Mayan. Of course he speaks Spanish as well and English. Really? Um, but he was like telling me about, and it's like, you know, there's Mayans who are in Mexico and Guatemala and, you know, down into Central America. There's still millions of people and still like a very intact culture there with their own language and customs and everything. And so he's like telling me about his grandmother and and and, and they have like a real tie to the land and the cenotes and all this experience of uh, all the history of what they used them for and you know he's like clarifying things about like people think they sacrificed the dead in these but really what it turns out they probably did is that they like had buried people and then they took their bones and they would put them in the cenote like after they were clean like i learned a lot of really cool things huh this is not a history lesson and i'm going to get uh pieces of it wrong but we swam in 3 that day and we swam in one that was half open half closed so, like a canopy. It's like, here you go, here's a lake sort of area, and then it goes into a cave that you can swim through and it comes up into another lake area. And when you swim through, it's a, it, there's enough air, you don't have to hold your breath to go from one to the next. It was, there was never a place that we had to completely do that. Well, so the second one, the second one, which was the crazy one, which was a completely enclosed one what? that had a stairwell I've got pictures of all this that what? if you're watching on video, you're seeing right now. But we went down these stairs and they had like built the stairs and built some things into the bottom of the thing that kind of made it feel a little bit Disney World-ish. You know what I mean? Like how, how far down did you go? Like what was the depth of stairs? 30 feet? 100 feet? 15 feet. Oh, okay. It's kind of like just underneath the surface of, oh. the, of, the, of the ground. Oh, okay. And... We get, now there's, there's hundreds of these. I don't know how many there are like in the Yucatan Peninsula, but it feels like there's hundreds of them. And just on this one like piece of land that we went down this dirt road, like we were passing all these signs. He says, each one of these is a cenote that you can swim in. So when we get to this one, there's no one there. Oh, wow. And he took us around to the back. Like it's this beautiful water and they put lights in the water so people could like go down there and they give you a snorkel and you can kind of like swim around. It's like 76 degrees or something. So a little a little cold water, but like not too bad. Mm -hmm. And it's that way all year round, you know? He takes us around to the back and it starts getting darker and darker and darker. He's got a little flashlight. He turns the flashlight off. You can't see anything. And it feels like we're just like 40 feet into this dark area, but we can't even see the, the light from where we came from. And then he's like, we're gonna go down into this little river, this little stream, and we're gonna swim in this stream and then swim back around. What? And I'm not claustrophobic, but I was thinking, A, uh, my wife is not the most, uh, what's a nice way to put this? Um, Jesse is clumsy, self-admittedly clumsy. And I was a little worried about her. She doesn't have a lot of like, she'll step on you. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're like in a room with her, uh, yeah. you don't watch her, she'll just step on you. Okay. Like walking past you by accident, she'll step on you. She'll, she might elbow you in the middle of the night in bed, that kind of thing. <laughs> As a big man, I've always tried to make myself small and be conscious of that. So maybe it's just because I'm big and it, I, there's, I'm controlling a lot of things. So I, I typically don't accidentally hit people, but my little wife hits people all the time. Maybe that's how she sees. It's kind of <laughs> like her version of sonar. Speaking of that, well, I'm she's gonna, a bat. I'm going to blow your mind. She's a touching bat. I'm going to blow your mind about bats. As you know, I have a fear of them. We swam around okay, this stick little, around for that. We swam around this little thing, and he would turn the light on, and 
he would shine it down into the water that was like deep. Like, okay, we'd be like going along, like crawling along in like 18 inches of water and then it would suddenly bottom out and we would look and it would just be black and there would be a rope coming up from the blackness. And he was like, that's the line that the scuba divers take. And what? they'll go into this cave and they'll swim to the next cenote. Oh, so yes, totally scuba the cave to the next thing, like an underwater trail and with a rope. And now you being oh scuba certified gosh. and me wanting to be scuba certified, but just not really having logistically lined up the time to make that happen. Because Shepard, you know, I floated the idea to Shepard. He was like, "This is very, this is a very cool thing. We call the four of us could go you together." Do it, man. But going into these caves and seeing those—that was like, I want to do that. So he was putting the flashlight under the water. Yeah, yeah. He had like a like, it was like a diving flashlight. Oh, that's In fact, cool. he was like, "We can't keep this light on too long outside of the water because it's not made for that. It gets too hot." It's a diving flashlight. You, oh, yeah, you yeah. should probably have one of these. Uh, Chase has one. So I, I just used his. But what I did is I would dive down and grab onto the rope and pull myself for a little bit. I went down like 20 feet and did like adjusted my what? my ears and like pulled myself. And then I realized that my lung capacity is just like dwindled so severely over the past like 10 years because I haven't been doing stuff like that, holding my yeah. breath. Yeah. But also, it's like, oh, if you have a scuba uh, situation, you don't have to hold your breath. <laughs> I, I can't, you need to have another level of certification that I don't yet have. For caves. For caves, yeah. It's uh, just you got to be trained in how to do that. But you'd be willing to you'd do oh, that with me? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Rhett, for the invitation. Well, I'm just saying, some people are like, I'm fine with scuba diving, but they get claustrophobic about caves. I, I don't... I'll think about it. After I'll think about it while I'm doing it and be like, why didn't I think about this before I did it? Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. And because you'll be there, you're going to be in charge. You're going to have to be very in charge. No, we're going to go with somebody who's in charge. Because I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm not going into a cave that somebody who has been in there many times who is leading us. I'm not going to, I'm not some, I'm not exploring. Okay. I'm not exploring the caves. I'm holding onto a line that somebody else has put in there. Whenever we talk about caves, I always go back to my junior year when I went on summer project in Santa Cruz and we, some of our friends from the project met some like students at like, I guess at UC Santa Cruz and they took us to some caves. These are not water caves. These are just normal caves. I think they've been covered up since, but, and we just had like, a little flashlight, not even a headlamp. Like we were following, we were like on our bellies crawling through this stuff. And it was so claustrophobic. There was one point where we had to, it, it's like it got so crunchy, like so crunched down and small, like, like all right, this is a, like a four foot divot that you gotta get through this to get to the other pocket. So you, and in order to get through, as skinny as I was, I had to empty my lungs. Yeah, I don't like, no, I don't like that. Hold my breath with my lungs empty and then crawl through. Like, that's crazy. And hold on, if you had to do that to get through, how did anyone else get through? It was a bunch of, it was a bunch of scrawny people. There's no way I would've gotten through it. There's no way you would've gotten through it. I don't like that. I can't believe I did that. Now, I'll, I'll say, yeah, going if, with if that's guy, being claustrophobic, like, I don't wanna be, not, I don't wanna be squeezing just, through something. That's just plumb crazy. I don't want to be squeezing through something where I might get stuck. Yeah. I don't like that idea. Where if you decide to breathe, you'll you'll get stuck. And if you got it, and when you've got this tank on, that limits your maneuverability too. You know. Yeah, but that's, they, but that's they'll why start you're at one cenote and they'll dive and they'll come up at another one. That's cool. I would definitely want to do that. There, we were going along. So back to Jesse for a moment. She's clumsy. We're going along and we kind of get to this place where we're starting to get where we can see where we're headed, where the light is in the main cave. And he's like pointing something out. And I just like look at Jesse and she just sort of just like, she kind of stands up a little bit and then you just completely just like falls over. Like, <laughs> and just hits a rock with her shoulder. Like, I don't, it was weird. Like, <laughs> from my perspective, it was, is as, it was as if she had just like turned off. You know what I'm saying? Like, from the back, it was just like she stood up. Power and down. And she, but she had like stepped on something soft and her foot kind of went down. And so for the rest of the trip, she had this like bruise and like scraped up shoulder. 
she was fine. She didn't like make a big deal about it when it happened. But I was like, baby, you gotta watch yourself. You gotta watch yourself. And she told I can't, I can't, she, she I told Limber that she was clumsy and he laughed. I was also thinking, uh, I don't know how often Limbert brings people into this particular situation, but uh, I can see a lot of people like, this isn't the kind of thing you could bring like 20 people and their grandma through. You know what I'm saying? Like you'd end up, yeah. somebody's gonna get hurt. Somebody's gonna hit their head. I hit my head on one of the stalag tights. Tights. Uh, once. For top. And I was like, hangs tight to the ceiling. Uh, T, T for top. Yeah, that's what I think of. And then like might M for maybe my. not. Don't worry about it. If you know tight, then you know the other ones. Because I, I, I thought it might be stalag, stalag might fall on you. No, that's it's the opposite. I screwed it up for you. Mm -mm. So, um, but then it, we get to this point, and he says, uh, "Look up," and I look up, and I see just a couple of feet away from me, hundreds of sleeping bats. A couple of feet away from you? Just like, he kind of waited and he shines and it's just like, they're just sleeping everywhere and they're just like, like a, bl a bat blanket. Oh, you hated that. What did you do in your brain? Uh, well, what, what could I do? Panic? You, I mean, like, you can't get away from them. Did and you, I was like, did there's- you, Did you have a fear response? Even Jesse did. Cause it was like, it's just kind of creepy, you know, to like see all these like animals that are kind of like hanging there. Are they gonna fall? And were that were they fluttering occasionally? Like a couple of them would like move a little, sh a little. Sh well, a little. they were kind of like a couple of them would be moving. They don't have wings, man. They have hands with skin. Well, that's kind of what wings are. Wings are just arms that evolved into, but not even with feathers. But not with a bat, dude. They're still hands with skin. Yeah. Um, when we got back out into the main area, like I started realizing they, uh, that there was several that were flying around. And that's really the thing that gets me is a bat that's flying around because at that time, Heather Dinklage got one right on the back of the neck. You know, we were outside in North Carolina. And <laughs> I, I don't know. I feel like through exposure therapy, this trip changed my relationship with bats because after that, I started realizing that there's bats everywhere in Mexico uh, where we were at, including the resort every single night because there's a, there's a cenote on the resort that we ended up going to. We t took a little bike ride around the nature trail and the guy took us in there and showed us all the baby bats. Ooh. And there were bats flying everywhere. But were they dookieing on you? Interesting. They constantly- guano on They you? constantly guano. Is it a verb? Because let's Probably make not. it such. They constantly guanate. Yeah, <laughs> guaning. <laughs> Into the water, and we asked the question. Which you were in. So we're in this water, and you were telling me earlier that these this was the drinking water for the Mayans, and he was like, he explained it, again, details, I don't remember. <laughs> the guano does not make the water uh, not potable. Like it's still completely clean based on the the process that's happening and the constant like inflow, and it's, it's doesn't make, it doesn't never made them sick. It doesn't make anybody sick. And there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of bats in every one of these caves, just constantly guanating into the water. Huh. huh. It's not a problem. Not a problem. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. Guana, guana, guana is, guano is not a problem. It's not a problem. Um, okay, I'm gonna get to the anxiety in a moment. I, will, I had another, uh, it's one, of, it's one of these situations where something happened that then I interacted with the internet and now I'm going back to contextual, contextualize the situation. Okay. And that was, um, I told you about this ahead of time. I told you that I had purchased um, a matching set of a, a short sleeve shirt and shorts yep. to wear on my vacation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is not a first for me. Uh, you might recall the watermelon set that I had in Mexico maybe five years or six years ago. That's right. Uh, so this is something that I am known to partake in while in Mexico, apparently. And while watching season two of White Lotus, which I gotta say, seems to be more and more recognized as being better in the second season than the first season, just so you know. I mean, that, that's kind of, that, that's the way the tide seems to be turning. Interesting. Um, 
But what's her name's fling boyfriend from England in the in the show? The quote nephew. The nephew is he he wears this outfit during the show. And I had seen that outfit advertised to me on Instagram because that's how Instagram works. It gets into your head and knows exactly what you like. Mm-hmm. And ended up purchasing this set. But I went with the pink one. Because I was like, mix it up a little bit. Go yeah, pink. Good. I think I should have gone green. There's green and there's navy and there's pink. I went pink. Okay, yeah. Actually, I think the green was sold out in my size. Maybe that's what happened. Anyway, I was trying to figure out when I was going to wear it on vacation. <laughs> and since we were spending- Every day, man. Since we were spending a lot of time at the resort, and it was a nice place, but what I was finding is that people just kind of show up at the restaurants in the resort in a, they're not like, hey, I'm in a matching set. You know what I'm saying? Like it was, it, it was more like, I've got on shorts and a, I got on my, people weren't dressed up. Uh-huh. But it was kind of like, I don't know, I, I got the thing, I'm gonna wear it. What's their problem? And um, I wore it that one night and actually one of the, the couple that was sitting next to us was like, oh, he like said the brand. Oh, the brand is the Dandy Del Mar, free, free ad for Dandy Del Mar. Oh yeah, not a sponsor. And he's like, Dandy Del Mar, nice. This is Dandy Del Mar, he was wearing a shirt. See, so he was dressed and up. I And I was like, uh, you guys watch White Lotus? And she was like, I feel like I'm living it. <laughs> and- um, Okay. And, and then, I was like, yeah, the nephew wears this this outfit. And that, I saw it and I was like, I'm gonna get that for the trip or whatever. But we, so we talked about it, but then I like, so we, and we didn't have a convers- much of a conversation with this couple, then we go back to our dinner. And I say to Jesse, I said, my outfit is not making me feel like I thought it would. <laughs> Just a moment of vulnerability with my lovely wife. And then her immediate response is, you should tweet that. <laughs> she was like, that sounds like a tweet. That sounds, she was like, that sounds like a relatable tweet. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to tweet on this see vacation. This tweet. I saw that, but okay, go ahead. And so the, she was like, here, I'll take a picture of you. I'll, I'll take a picture of you. And we're in this like restaurant that's kind of like, it have to, it's like in, indoor, outdoor, beautiful place uh, where like the canal in the middle of the resort kind of comes up to where our table was. But there's like people, including a family of like mom and a dad and three kids sitting over there. And I'm like, I, I, you know me, I don't, I don't like to be, I don't like to stand up and be like, I'm getting my picture taken in this outfit. I, I don't like to do that. Mm. And, but Jesse was like, just do it. I was like, okay, this is funny. This is for the internet. So I stood up and I kind of like made a face that was like, Capture the idea of I don't feel it's like this. I, I, this outfit is not making me feel like I thought it would. So. Yeah, I saw that picture. But what I did is I tweeted it without attaching the picture, and then I replied to the tweet with the picture. Of course, Jesse, you know, she's my social media manager. Um, That's how you got to do it. And uh, she explained why that was the thing that I needed to yeah. do. I'm just I just follow the directions. I do what she tells me to. Okay. And uh, <laughs> As Jesse was taking the picture of me standing out there by myself, the mom from the family that was watching said, "Um, if you want me to get a picture of both of you, just let me, I I can get a picture of both of you. And instead of just saying, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just say, okay, please. I said, uh. Please say you said, okay. Don't worry. She, um. And now more people are listening. Other tables are listening because yeah. I'm having to say this to this woman across across the restaurant. Oh, is what it felt like. Don't I, worry. Don't worry. She. We're, this is for Twitter. <laughs> oh, uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. You made it worse. And I think that I upset her. You know, because I'm. It, you know, she offered to take a picture of us, and it was like, no, no, this is just me. <laughs> I want my wife to take a picture of just me for Twitter. And I didn't. So interesting. Uh, I didn't. Then it would explain. Well, this is a joke. Like no, no, I'm doing you, you, a joke you've for said Twitter. Enough. You've said plenty. Uh, yeah. To her. Um, so they must have thought, oh, it's a Twitter guy. Christy saw this picture before I did, and uh, I'm across the room petting my doggies, and she goes, 
Rhett just posted a picture of him in an outfit, and I think it's the same one that you bought. I hate to break it to you, but I looked at the picture and I was like, well, his is pink, mine is green. Oh, I almost got, I would have gotten the green one if I didn't have the size, if they had had my size. I had forgotten, because you did tell me the whole, you said, I bought this thing, I'm gonna wear it to Mexico. You mentioned that to me because we were talking about White Lotus. Uh, I'd forgotten you said that, and then I was like, I need to get some, I wanna get some loungewear for whenever I go to Mexico. And I bought, I found myself on the site, and I was, because I just searched uh, resort wear. And then that's the site that came up. That's the, it's the site for that. And I got the I I was going to get the blue one, but they didn't have my size. So I, and I wasn't going to get the pink one. So I got the oh, green well, one. I shouldn't have gotten the pink. And one. let me tell you, man, I I'm not going to make the mistake you made. I'm going to flaunt it hard. I'm going to show up to places, and and they're going to be like, "Who is that? Well, Who is that?" When you Who put these when you put that? these things on the internet, uh, that's fun. Now, first of all, I'm, and put, I'm not going to make that face you made in my pictures. I'm putting it on the internet as a way to entertain, of course. But as is always the case, whenever you put anything on the internet, people think you're making what people, you're searching for compliments. People think that oh, maybe you are. He, maybe that's he, he a must part be. Of he it. Mu- well, here's what I did. It's okay if it is. Uh, well, I'm not saying that every picture I put on the internet is. There, I'm, there are pictures of me that I would post on the internet that I am in some part of my brain fishing for compliments, but because I very specifically did not want that to be the case in this one, I was like- You made that face. I'm gonna make this face, and I, look, and I looked at it, and I was like, my legs look weird, you yep. know, like my knees looks fat or something. Like, there's but a I weird bet thing. You, you know, fans misinterpreted the face as he needs a compliment. Some, <laughs> some people, of course, some people did that. But then a lot of people- uh, took it upon themselves, and that's just totally fine, to explain to me why it wasn't making me feel like I wanted it to feel. And it was that it was too, it was too close to my skin tone. I'm too pink to wear mm. pink. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, uh, maybe that maybe that's the case. I, I, I should have got the green. Now you've got the green. I can't get the green. Um, but I also, uh, m- maybe... Maybe we, at some point we do go to Mexico together and we wear the, we, we wear maybe them we at the same time. Maybe we do the pink time. and the green. Or maybe I get the blue and the blue and the green. I bought another one and then I wore it downstairs and Lando and Christy said, you got to return that. From the same site? No, from a different site. Do you want to see this picture? Because I've, I've returned it. Yeah, you're making, a, you're making a face at me. It doesn't work, does it? She said I look like a little Dutch boy. Um, like I want to be a little Dutch boy. I feel like the, I mean I just feel like walking the sh- the around shorts the pool. are kind of kind of pushing it a little bit. The shorts are uh, are too small. But when I looked at the models, their britches were that tight too. It's yeah. all about the look on your face. Is what? But and I didn't have the right look on my face. Um, but actually, I kind of do have the right look on my face. You don't look confident enough. Oh, mm, okay. Yeah, I don't. Um, we had an excellent time. Did you though? Um, I'm glad. We had a lot of made a lot of love. Uh, that was one of the goals. You know, you want to make a you want to make love at least daily. So we did that a couple of times twice. So, I mean, for seven days. Yeah, that's impressive, dude. I mean, at a certain point, you're just like, well. What, let's do. What else are we going to? Well, do? you got to mix it up a little bit. I mean, skip. I mean, I wouldn't have held it against you to skip a day. I would still be like, "Wowzer, that's good, man." Well, it was a little bit of a goal. Okay, there you go. You know, so you actually you you both set out to be completionist about we it. We just talked a lot about the sex that we were going to have in Mexico. Well, you don't build it up. And so, and then we then we fulfilled that. Oh wow, we delivered on that. So, but you were like every single day. We're not going to miss a day. Did you have to talk about? I think that? I said something like that. I was like, "Well, we should. I mean, we should do it every day." You know? Question mark. Um. 
Submission accomplished there. Submission accomplished. Yeah, we tried a little bit of that. Who to who? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wore a collar uh, in my pink outfit. <laughs> no, Can I borrow the pink no, outfit? Nothing. It's too, be, too big for you. Well, it's, maybe that's what it needs. It, it's a it needs a little drop shadow. It's a double X. Like I, that, I had to get a double XL in that shirt. Okay, that's okay. how small that size runs. All right. Runs. All right. Um, so I... Uh, I noticed something about myself when I was on vacation, and this is something that's actually always been present, but I, it hit me in a way that it hasn't before. Maybe it's just because, you know, cumulative years of therapy at this point make me more sensitive to what I'm actually feeling and thinking. Um, Good. So I was like, we had a really crazy year last year. You were there. <laughs> um, yeah. But unlike some previous years where I feel like there are things on the horizon of the new year that could be a source of anxiety for me, it felt like a lot of the sources of anxiety came to a close. Mm -hmm. We got answers on things at the end of the year. I feel that. And I'm looking forward to, have been looking forward to this year with much more anticipation than anxiety. Very excited about everything that we're doing at Mythical and the stuff that we're making and the ideas that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's more just like a giddy, like maybe there's an impatience of like wanting to get to it, but not an anxiety about it. Yeah. Not even really an anxiety about is, is it going to perform well or people are going to be into this new stuff that we're going to try. I'm kind of like, I'm not really doing it for that anymore. Yeah. So, but what I found was I would find myself trying to relax into a book or just a chair <laughs> and having this anxiety. And then immediately, the, what I always have always done is like, you feel the physical anxiety and then you stop and you try to find the source of the anxiety in your brain, right? Uh -huh, yeah. And then you're like, oh, it's that. It's that thing that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's the kids at home. You know, something's going to happen. Or it. But then I I started talking to Jesse. And I was like, you know, I'm beginning to realize that I have always had a baseline of anxiety, but I'm always because we've been so busy for so long, always able to immediately. Um, track it to something that I can then put myself into. And I don't have like a- Solve it, dissipate it, or, address it. Yeah, and I'm not like- um, The external. And so, and I don't think, I don't think I usually present as an anxious person, maybe to you sometimes or to my, or to Jesse, you know, more often or whatever. Um, but I've never been like, oh, I'm, I'm, I have an anxiety problem or I have an anxiety disorder. And I'm not saying that I do, maybe I do, I don't know. I'm still exploring this. But what I did what I did find is that, oh no, I actually, like if you if, if there was a dial and there was a baseline of anxiety, I realized that my baseline is elevated and it's a physiological thing that doesn't necessarily have a source. My brain senses that my, and I'm not a psychologist, but, the way that it feels is as if my brain senses that my body is anxious and then it provides the source of the anxiety for itself to then try to figure out and solve. And so then I'll do something like write a bunch of ideas down or figure this thing out or like, you know, come up with something or execute something and then it dis my anxiety dissipates because I've done something. I've identified the source and then I've gone and tried to do something to solve it. But you're saying that there's, no, that's not the full source. Like at this point, I'm saying that because it, those things weren't there. I'm saying that it's not, it's not linked to any particular actual thing, any reality. It is a physiological baseline that I've been operating at this heightened level, not like debilitating, but annoying and sort of obvious present level of anxiety. And it's why I've never been able to relax on a vacation. I always look at a vacation as an opportunity to accomplish something like, okay, seven days in Mexico. Yes, you're going to have these things that you're going to do, but really you're doing this 
so that A, you'll recharge your battery so that you can be fully charged at the top of the year and get all this stuff done. Or you're gonna like take in some information that then you're going to be able to translate into something that you're going to accomplish. Or you're gonna like have this moment where your brain gets silent and then you come up with this great idea and then you get back and you tell Link about it. Like, but I, but I realized two things. One, the baseline of anxiety exists apart from circumstances. So that's the first thing that I'm, and then, and then I try to come up with something to explain the anxiety. And what that causes me to not do is to actually acknowledge that, oh no, you're just, there's, there's anxiety there that doesn't have a source other than just your disposition and you need to explore that and not to find some event or something that you're anticipating, but, all, but to, to just acknowledge that, oh, you, ha you have this disposition, how can you go about addressing how can you go about addressing this baseline and change your baseline? Which I don't exactly know yet. I'm just gonna, I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I'm doing, but but like low level anxiety is something that is that exists. It seems like that's what you're describing. But because for so long my remedy to the anxiety has been identifying the problem, then immediately working towards the solution. I'm not very good at enjoying a vacation, right? And I'm also not very good at, uh, and this is an overused term, being in the moment. And I've always, I've always known that, that I'm not great at being in the moment, but I didn't really understand what that meant. I th and I don't fully yet, but I'm beginning to think things like, you are about to go swim in a cenote, right? Mm -hmm. Swim in this cenote, uh, as well as you possibly can, like experience this as fully or only. Yeah, yeah. Don't Not like as fully, but don't only. be. Yeah, like you don't have to. Nothing else has to be figured out right now. You don't have to be thinking about anything. You don't have to be thinking about how all oh, this thing's happening. I'm going to talk about it on Ear Biscuits, which is it has become a factor with a lot of things now. Mm -hmm. Um, but just be like, no, you're having this dinner right now. You're having this moment with Jesse right now. You're having this moment with your kid right now. Whatever. It doesn't have to be on vacation. And being present for that, um, and just kind of uh, recognizing the pattern. And when you feel, so when I feel the anxiety right now, what I've been doing is just stopping and doing some box breathing, which I know you're familiar with. But, you know, it's just, I mean, you can look it up, but it's essentially breathing in, holding your breath, breathing out, holding, holding your, your breath, breath, and then repeating the process. Some people like call it Navy SEAL breathing and that you, you know, it, and it's actually been pretty transformative in just like the few weeks that I've been doing it. Really? So I'm just trying to break the pattern of like, when I feel there's this low level of anxiety. Chasing it. And I would be like, okay, well, what is that? Let me, there's, there's, it's funny. It's like, when I turn towards the sources of anxiety, there's like, it's like a bunch of little anxiety guys in a line. Like here, I'm hey, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And if like you move past him, it's like oh, I'm here. Like there's at any given time, and this is true of I think everybody. There's at least a dozen sources of anxiety. There's a, you know, the busier we get, the more sources there are. But then I started realizing, oh, actually, it's not about those things. Like those things just happen. I can address those things when I need to address them on the at the scheduled time that I need to address them. But kind of just saying, I'm going to put my hand up to the little anxiety guys lined up and I'm just going to do something to address the physiological response that I'm having. So box breathing, again, it's not, I had to kind of get out of my head and thinking that I'm going to be able to address something, solve a problem, and then reduce the anxiety and just be like, if there's a pre-existing physiological thing that's happening in me that's causing anxiety, maybe there is a existing tool, physiological tool in this box breathing that I can do that addresses it without having to bring in a problem to solve. And it has been pretty, tra it's been transformative. I've been doing it quite a bit. And then it'll be like, oh, you're calm now. That worked. Now, and, and then also adding on the, and what are we doing right now? Can you enjoy that? And then realize that you'll get to all those little things that are lining up. You'll get to well, that. Well, I want to hear some of that breathing. I want, not right now. I'm saying, when, I want to hear you. I want to become aware that you're doing that when you need it. Well, then I feel like you're watching me. Oh, I'll, I'll be listening. But 
Um, I told you that I've been doing more breathing, and then Christy was like, why do you keep doing that? What is that? She started getting annoyed by it. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it well, because it sounds like you're sighing. Yeah, it's like, what's happening to you over there? You're like, are you disintegrating? Are you like <laughs> flopping, flopping over? Well, that was, that, all right, that is, I'm going to co-op that as my wreck, man. Try some box breathing. Yeah, it's a good wreck. I didn't have a wreck for this episode, and I knew it was mine. Boy, I've been anxious this whole episode about that. <laughs> this has been fun to catch up. You know what? Mission accomplished. Let's close with some box breathing. You breathe, breathe in. in. Hold one, two, three, four. Exhale. One. <gasps> oh my god it's funny I mean so you do that, that was one you do box. like six do to eight as many of those. as you want uh, I do find that uh, I there's all kinds of uh, different versions of this but one that I found was somebody that talked about doing a double breath because one of the things that you're doing obviously by doing this is like you're getting more oxygen because maybe without even noticing it as you've been you've been breathing shallower and shallower as you're anxious but you're kind of like you're getting more oxygen you're clearing out the carbon dioxide, but a double breath. This is pretty interesting. So you, when, as you breathe in, if you breathe in and then you realize I can actually breathe in again quite a bit more than I just did. And like a second breath on top of your initial breath, that feels pretty amazing. It hurts, it hurts. I'm stretching my lung. All right. Makes you a little lightheaded, but it feels so good. Be a part of this conversation, hashtag Ear Biscuits, or in the comments on the YouTube video, which now comes out two days after. Look at that. The audio version. Ear Biscuits is Monday, Wednesday. And of course, call us and let us know how you're processing, reacting to these conversations. And well, you know what? We might just let everybody hear it. One eight eight eight. EarPod One. Hi, I just wanted to share my experience with making a list of my top moments of the year. Uh, it's something uh, that was obviously inspired by y'all. Your top moments of the year is pretty much one of my favorite podcasts that y'all do every single year. I decided to start tracking in my phone my favorite things every single year and it was pretty awesome and it was really refreshing to have this list of my favorite days of the year that I could always kind of revisit in my phone. And anytime I was going through a dry stretch where it was maybe a few weeks, maybe more than a month without one of those special days, I would be able to look at just how many there were in the past and know that there's plenty more amazing days in the future. So it was a really rewarding experience and I thank y'all for uh, inspiring me to do that. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.